In both testaments, Jesus is pictured as the suffering servant. But we must also see him as being victorious too. Our crucified conqueror brought victory through humiliation. Old Testament Isaiah describes him as a redeemer who appeared, whose appearance was marred more than any man, chapter 52, verse 14. He would be despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, chapter 53, verse 3. In what has been commonly referred to as the crucifixion psalms, Old Testament David wrote a pictorial prophecy of Jesus. David portrayed Jesus as saying, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melted within me, chapter 22, verse 14. In Mark 8, verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. In the New Testament, Paul declared that he resolved to focus only on Jesus Christ and him crucified, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. Paul affirmed that Jesus gave himself up for our sins, becoming a curse for us, Galatians 1, verse 4, and 3, verse 13 and accepting the lowest form of poverty so that we might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Peter named himself as a witness to the suffering of Christ. 1 Peter 5, verse 1. And Peter wrote, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. The spiritual meaning of the Sanhedrin trial, as well as the crucifixion of Jesus, was difficult for the Jews to grasp. They were looking for a conquering Christ, and not a suffering servant. The crucified Jesus was a rock of offense to the Jews and a testimony of foolishness to the Gentiles. The Jews wanted a Messiah of conquest who would restore the kingdom of Israel to her former glory as in the days of King Solomon. The Greeks demanded a demonstration of philosophical wisdom to make them believe. Instead, for both groups, God chose the cross, a despised and shameful death, to be the revelation of his love and wisdom. He turned the most or worst imaginable divide, uh, demise into a throne from which Jesus would reign as king of kings. He chose the foolish things of the world, to shame the wise, and ordain the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27. To all sinners who would receive him, this Jesus who suffered and died on the cross is God's wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, as well as redemption. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. Jesus used his suffering to bring victory in three different manners. The first way, his victory over suffering provides an example for us. It shows us how to handle our pain. Peter wrote, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, 1 Peter 1, or uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 22, or 21. 1 Peter 2, verse 20. Christ is our model 
for every aspect of living. But Peter's statement highlights Jesus' example of how Christians are to handle pain. Well, how did Jesus respond to his time of standing before the, fan, uh, the Sanhedrin and nailed against the cross? He did not sin or deceive anyone as he suffered persecution and rejection. He did not retaliate for the evil that we did to him. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he did utter no threats. 1 Peter 2, verse 23. He took all the pain, humiliation, and sorrow heaped upon him and entrusted it to God, the one who judges all things righteously and properly. The Christian will not always find his path smooth and easy to travel. It's somewhat like our Michigan roads. In living the Christian life, we may experience hardships, ridicule, or even physical pain. We, as our Lord, can be hated by the world in facing mental and social trials as well as injustice. When the sky turns black with clouds of opposition and persecution, how should the Christian respond? We should look to our Jesus and imitate the way he reacted in his darkest hours, as seen in the wilderness temptation and the last 24 hours of his physical life. Jesus stands alongside the suffering Christian, and he reminds us with his nail-pierced hands, feet, and uh, pierced side of the spear to commit our suffering to God. The second way, his victory through suffering manifests God's love for us. So what prompted the great God of heaven to bleed, to agonize, and to die for us. Paul wrote, For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. Romans 5, verse 7. Jesus was not compelled to die for us because we are such righteous folk or in any way deserving of his death. In truth and humiliation or, or humility, we must admit that Jesus died for us while we were still helpless, Romans 5, verse 6. That is, while we were sinful, rebellious, and without honor or hope because of our unfaithfulness. We were dead in sin, dominated by the devil disobedient to God's will, driven by the lust of our flesh, behaving as children of wrath. Yet Jesus on the cross took God's wrath for us. Even though we were in this despicable condition, God being rich in mercy and motivated by his great love for us, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 6. When we look at what Jesus has done, we can only say how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. 1 John 3, verse 1. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. John 15, Verse 13. The third way. His victory came through suffering in order to soothe the justice of God. The redemption God provided for us required a kind of suffering on Jesus' part that no human can completely understand. Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. To propitiate means to appease God's wrath. His justice demands that sin is dealt with in harmony with all the holiness, 
purity, and righteousness of his absolute character. God could not just overlook sin. His justice commanded punishment and appeasement for man's sin, while his love and grace sought salvation and forgiveness for man. These attributes seem to conflict with one another, but God's nature has no disagreements. His attributes are perfect and are completely harmonized. Justice insists punishment and his grace blocked it. Grace required salvation and his justice obstructed it. Jesus was the only answer to the just demands of God's holy nature. As the embodiment of grace, Jesus bore the punishment of sin. Whatever God's divine righteousness required in expediation of man's sin, Jesus' suffering caused God love and desire to save us. We in our human reasoning will ask, how can a good God send a sinful man to hell? Where the New Testament asks, how can a righteous God bring a sinful man to heaven? And that will be the Apostle Paul's profound statement throughout his writing of the book of Romans. How can God redeem man? God answers this serious question in one word. Jesus. Paul sums up this deep truth in Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus, the crucified conqueror, came not as a mighty warrior swinging a metal sword for revolution against the Roman Empire or to reform the Jewish nation. But he entered this world as a suffering servant. He bore our griefs and sorrows and was pierced through for our transgressions. Even though at that time of his suffering, he was esteemed as stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God, Ephesians, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 4. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed, Isaiah 53, verse 5. A meek lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Not a mighty king upon an earthly throne has conquered sin and death and provided us salvation. But a lowly Jesus, the crucified, did once for all. Now, as a result of this, on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter, with the Jewish multitude standing before him, told them what God has done. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, Acts 2, verse 36. Jesus, the crucified conqueror, is now been declared both Lord and Christ, or Savior. Now, the Greek word curious, translated Lord, in the New Testament, had a wide range of meanings in the first century, such as sir or master, all of which in some way emphasized the worthiness of honor and authority. In the scriptures, the word is used in reference to Jesus of the Godhead and to mankind 
like husbands, masters of slaves, and anyone who in a certain context should be addressed with respect. In the width of this range as seen in Sarah, who on the human side of it called her husband Abraham Lord, 1 Peter 3, verse 6. And Thomas, who on the divine side of it declared before the nail-pierced hands and feet of Jesus, my Lord and my God, John 20, verse 28. Lord was a word which depended heavenly upon the background for its specific application. This word was clearly used by the inspired writers in a special circumstance of deity for Jesus. In the setting of Acts 2, verse 36, Peter used this word to convey that Jesus wasn't only the promised Messiah, but also the only one whom God had crowned as Lord of his church, or the spiritual body, and the one to whom all humanity would have to look in obedience for salvation. The title, as Peter used it in Acts 2, verse 36, attributes to Jesus what Peter would later say of Jesus before the Jewish council. And there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. The Lordship of Jesus can and must be regarded from four different viewpoints. The first one, as we look at it from its great commencement, we see him as our risen Lord. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, that Jesus was proclaimed to be God's Son through raising him from the dead. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus was, is, and always will be the son of God in the sense of being the second member of the Godhead. But in this sense of his administrative role in the Christian age, in this, his sense of being the captain of our salvation in the divine wealth of human redemption, his resurrection declares him to be God's son as he became in the fullness Jesus Christ our Lord. Just as he had to live and face temptations as a man in order to become our perfect Savior, even so he has been raised from the dead in order to qualify as our divine Lord and the head of the New Testament church. The resurrection of Jesus is the highest type of apologetic evidence. It is one argument that neither Jews nor Gentiles could logically give an answer to the question. Who moved the body? They, like all other saints, are unable to humanly answer the testimony of the empty tomb. The only explanation that can be given is that it, he divinely rose from the dead. One is forced to accept or reject Christianity on the basis of the resurrection. The New Testament Christian has embraced the only religion whose founder conquered death and is not dust in the wind like all the others who have started a religion. However, his resurrection is more than just proof for his messiahship. It is the historic moment and the reality of Jesus becoming Lord. Paul also said, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord 
both of the dead and the living. Romans 14, verse 9. God qualified Jesus to be our Lord by raising him from the dead. He is our Lord in the divine quality as well as our Lord in divine acknowledgement. Lordship has been assigned to him because in living and dying sinless, he has earned it. His resurrection confirms his right to it. Second, as we look at it from the standpoint of its great continuance, we see him as our reigning Lord. There is an age-long preeminence to his lordship. God made him Lord and commissioned him to reign throughout the Christian age. Paul said that God manifests his great power in Jesus in Ephesians 1, verse 20 to 23, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he has put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. When God elevated him to this position of authority, he defined the head of the church or the kingdom for the Christian age as being Jesus Christ himself. From that time to this, from that period until the end of our age, every Christian looks only to Jesus as his head, his teacher, as his master. Definitely not a dead Muhammad or a live Pope, apostle, or president of some religious council. God has ordained Jesus to rule as Lord until the end of time. Paul describes this consummation of the age in this way, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23 to 26. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father. When he has abolished all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Three, or third. As we think of his lordship in the terms of its great consequence, we see him as our redemptive Lord. True salvation from sin comes from no other. The process of becoming a New Testament Christian is bathed in Christ's lordship. Paul wrote, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. Romans 10 verse 9 and 10. All the New Testament writers were guided by the Holy Spirit to describe man's salvation with brief Summaries. They attribute it to belief, John 8, verse 24, to repentance, Acts 11, verse 18, and to baptism, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. So when they talk, they talk being all inclusive and not exclusive. When they said people are saved by faith, they did not mean that they were saved by faith without any acts of faith other than a mental acceptance of Jesus. Unfortunately, a false teaching says as long as one believes or confesses that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, he is saved. 
This position does not really include any obedience. The New Testament writers meant when viewing salvation in one broad sweep, we are saved by faith. Obedience to all the commands in the pattern of salvation or what is known as the Great Commission. Paul did this also with the concept of the Lordship of Christ. He said that at the heart of becoming a Christian is acknowledging Jesus as Lord, as the Son of God, as the Messiah or Christ. He pictured confession of Jesus as including all the different acts of faith involved in coming to Jesus, such as belief, repentance, and water immersion into Christ. This is what Paul meant in the Romans 10 passage of confessing Jesus as Lord is the only way that a person can be saved. He must believe, he must repent, and must be immersed in water. Number four, as we view his lordship from the standpoint of his great complex or climax, we see him as our returning Lord. When Jesus comes again, he will come as our great Lord, as our victorious King, who will be coming to share his eternal victory with us in his precious home, having it been prepared for us. He will present us to our Father, and will at that time turn the kingdom over to the Father. Jesus himself said, and when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right, and the goats on the left. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 33. Jesus, our Lord, is the one who will lead us to ultimate victory. As the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos wrote the book of Revelation, he pictured Jesus as our glorious conquering king. In Revelation 19, starting at verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His, are, his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many di uh, diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except him. He is clothed with a robe dri uh, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe, and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. At the end of this reign of the King of Lord here, Jesus will come and his saved servants will rise to meet him in the air and they will always be with him. Yes, Jesus is our risen, reigning, redeeming and returning Lord. He is the second member of the Godhead, but he became completely man. In total identification with the human race, he permitted himself to die in our stead, carrying our sins in his body outside the camp. 
removing transgressions totally from those who put their obedient faith in Jesus. Following his death, he arose from the grip of death. He reigns now as the Christian's only head or Lord, living to lead us, living to love us, and living to lift us up to the Father's throne when he comes in the clouds at the end of the age. When we see him, we will fall at his feet and proclaim, as did the Apostle Thomas, my Lord and my God. However, this will not only be the reaction of the faithful of all time, but others as well. In Philippians 2, starting in verse 9, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Peter told us in Acts chapter 2 that Jesus is not Lord. But the <laughs> apostle also called Jesus Christ or Savior. So what then has Jesus done for us as a Savior? Well, our scripture reading that was read earlier, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, gives us a three-point answer. First, he saved us from our sin. In verse 1 and verse 2 of 1 John 1, what was from the beginning and what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld, and our hands handed concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life. Which was with the Father and was manifest to us. We can refer to Jesus in various ways. He is our teacher. Our example. Our friend. He is our door. Our light. Our water of life. Our bread and path. However, John wrapped it up in these metaphors, combined each of these great attributes of Jesus and put them into two words. Eternal life. According to John, the person who has Jesus has life eternal. The entire affliction brought by sin, guilt, shame, weakness, and condemnation are dealt with when Jesus imparts eternal life to a sinful soul. Secondly, he has saved us from a separation with God. Still in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The apostles entered into this divine fellowship and now through their inspired word from the Holy Spirit, we can enter into it with them and be at one with God the Father and God the Son. Lost sinners cannot walk with him. Any sin unrepented will cause us to enter into darkness and to woe. In. John says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1, verse 6. And if we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. However, according to our Savior, this fact implies that Jesus has not only saved us, but he also keeps us safe. As we walk in the light, we are continually cleansed with the results in our maintaining fellowship with the Godhead and everyone who is walking daily in this light. 1 John 1, verse 7. All those who are standing in God's grace, as we stand in God's grace, we can worship God sincerely, truthfully, and properly. Number three. 
Jesus has also saved us from sorrow. 1 John 1 verse 4. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This joy can only be received through the eternal life that Christ imparts. The joy of salvation is the highest type of joy, for it abides apart from all the circumstances, in spite of the pain that we experience and regardless of what might happen to the ungodly world. So we are saved from sin, separation, and sorrow. Jesus, the crucified conqueror as Lord, is coming to judge those that did and did not accept him. Jesus is our absolute, complete Savior. He is our initial Savior, for he has saved us from our past sins. He is our continual Savior. For he keeps us saved by washing us daily from our current sins. And he is our ultimate Savior. For he will take us to the Heavenly Father at some point in the future. And lead us into the eternal kingdom of heaven that has been fashioned for us. He is the word of life. The truth about life. He is eternal life. The salvation of life. He, he is the joy of life. The true and abiding happiness of life. Again reflecting on Acts chapter 2 verse 36 to 38. Which is the plan of salvation at the conclusion of Peter's sermon on Pentecost. This passage states that God has now made this Jesus Lord and Savior because of the sins that we caused him at the cross. So we need to ask ourselves what we must do that has to be done in order to make things right between us and God. If you believe what has been taught from the Bible this morning, then repent of your sins coming forward and you can be immersed in water for the washing away of your sins, forgiven by the blood of Christ, the crucified conqueror. You're subject to his invitation, to his calling. Come right now as together we stand.